All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, full room, which is good at 5 o'clock. Usually it uh, dies off a little bit. I guess a lot of people have smelly code. Uh, we have here uh, Kushar, and he is going to tell us about smelling configuration code. So, uh, Thank you. <clears throat> everybody can hear me, especially from the back? Yeah. Excellent. OK, my name is Tushar, as he introduced me. And I am a researcher in Athens University of Economics and Business. Let, let me, before I start, let me do a quick reality check. How many people use Puppet? Wow. And uh, anything else? Any other configuration system? Ansible CFO. That's also ni nice. Excellent. So we are very much, you are very much in the right room because I'm going to talk about Puppet and that all the smells that I'm going to talk about, they are more or less applicable in other configuration management system also. So what I'm going to talk about, smells in general, configuration smells in particular. I'm going to uh, take a few examples, and I'll show why we consider them as a smell. And towards the end of it, I will, I'll talk about uh, tools that we can use to detect these smells. So <clears throat> let's start with the term smell. The term smell was introduced in this book by Kent Beck in chapter four of this book. And he described it as certain structures in the code that suggest or sometimes scream for the possibility of refactoring. This is an informal definition. And I would like to give you an idea, a deeper idea, a better idea of what uh, a smell may look like by an, using an analogy. And uh, I would like to do using a, uh, I'm introducing a new word called jugar. Anybody in this room has, uh, has heard of this word jugar? Yeah. So <clears throat> jugar is, I mean, it's OK, because jugar is a Hindi word. And by the way, Hindi is, uh, if I'm not wrong, fourth. Wide, widely used language in the world uh, after Chinese, Spanish, and English. So uh, this, is, this is the word from uh, Hindi, and which means a workaround, a simple workaround, or a hack. This, uh, whatever the definition is, probably doesn't give you the sense what a jugad may look like. So let me give you a few examples, real world examples. <laughs> somewhere in uh, somewhere in a student, uh, some some student in night want to drink a coffee because he has some exam in, uh, next day, maybe Java exam, and uh, well the canteen is closed in the night, so well he's using iron box to make the coffee. It's, it's quite hot in uh, India. And uh, if you don't have AC and still you want to work on your PC, then uh, somewhat these kind of uh, arrangement you need to make to make your PC happy and yourself happy. This is what happens when you have two. Uh, brother and sister, and then they have one room each, and they want equal share of cold air. So, and by the way, if you don't recognize this, this is a pajama. <laughs> well, <laughs> so what? If the clock is broken, it still works. And you know, we can still uh, arrange something to uh, make our goal. <laughs> the owner don't want to go to a service center and you know uh, spend money on the proper locking system. He gone to a local store. He just said, "Okay, put me a lock here," and it, in most cases it works. Well, uh, my aim, uh, why uh, why I am uh, showing these pictures and why I introduced the, a new word to you is because. I think there is a relation between jugar and smells. In fact, what I think is smells are jugar in software. And uh, 
Why I think so? Because uh, like smells, jugad are temporary solutions. You cannot use it for a long time. They, they serve some purpose, they solve some problem, but they introduce quality deficit. It applies to both of them, I mean smells and jugards. Although there is a big difference also, so we need to understand that also because jugard come with a positive connotation and smells come with a negative connotation. So normally jugards are considered innovative in when the resources are meager or limited. However, smells introduce, gets introduced when uh, the people don't have sufficient knowledge or they are ignorant. However, still, there are some similarities between both of these metaphors, and that's why I think they are similar in nature. And uh, let's talk about smell again. So uh, smells uh, was introduced, I, as I told you, that it was introduced in 1999 by, in, in the book uh, by Martin Fowler and Ken Beck. And then many people worked on that. And if you look at uh, literature, you will find at least 40 different terms used for smells. And I'm not talking about specific smells, by the way. There are many more. These are the terms used to describe smells. And uh, I'm also, I also work a lot, uh, from at least from last four or five years, on, uh, on this topic. And uh, one of the things that I, I am proud of is this book which I co-authored with my other two colleagues, which is on design smells, the smells that may occur in design, software design. OK, so, but we are talking about configuration smells. And before I introduce configuration smells to you, let me introduce infrastructure as code. I guess it's not really required for me to spend too much time on uh, introduc introductory slides, but let me do it for the sake of completeness. Infrastructure as code is a practice, is a practice of specifying computing system configuration through code, automating uh, system deployment, and uh, managing system configurations through traditional software engineering practices. What I mean is that you Right, if you want to have a server and which you want to make sure that a certain service is installed and work, uh, running, then you can write something like this. By the way, it's a puppet example. So, uh, and all the examples that I'm going to show is, is, is pup, are from puppet. So you can write something like that. It's a very simple example just to show what you can do. And uh, if you want to create a new user, you can write something like this, and you can specify the properties of the user, and you are done. And the puppet will take care of how to create and how to do that. You just specify what you want. And obviously, there are many more. Uh, I, some of them I just mentioned, uh, I have mentioned here, but there are many more. And in the context of traditional software engineering, what infrastructure as code does it brings infrastructure, configuration code, tools, and services in the purview of software system. What it means is you apply traditional software engineering practices not only on production code, but also on infrastructure and configuration code. And when I say traditional software engineering practices, I mean like testing, reviewing, versioning, and many more uh, similar practices. And this is the time to introduce configuration smell. Well, this is a big <coughs> definition, but probably two most important things in this definition is that it violates the recommended best, best practices. So which is these are the best practices uh, coming from the experiences people like you. They have a lot of experiences in uh, writing puppet code or in general configuration code, and they, uh, they, they derived some best practices. So these are the best practices. If, if uh, a newbie is violating these best practices, basically uh, he is actually introducing configuration smell. And these are the smells that why we consider them as, as a smell because, because they 
affect programs quality in negative way. Now what we have done, uh, me and my colleagues in uh, my university where I work, uh, that we uh, collected all the resources uh, started from starting from uh, puppet uh, uh, puppet website which specify how to write what to not what not to write and things like that and many other blogs many other books and we consolidated and prepared a catalog of smells both and and we classified them as two uh, types of smells configuration smells one is implementation uh, configuration smells and another one is design configuration smells. So implementation configuration smells deals with the uh, local, uh, locally, uh, locally, uh, local impact like styling, indentation, and uh, something like that, uh, naming convention. And the design configuration, uh, design configuration smells deals with the, deals with the, uh, the module structure and, uh, and, and the structure of the repository and things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a few examples in both the categories and I'll show you what are what we consider as smells. So this is a piece of a puppet code. So let me go one by one. So in puppet, uh, import is deprecated. And so if we use, and probably there are, there might be many other statements which are deprecated. So when we use deprecated statements, we introduce smells. To do or fix me. You might, almost every developer in the world has at least one or two uh, to do's in his code. So which, which signifies that you want to do something, but you are waiting for some golden time. So. Uh, that's that's indicate that, that that's the incomplete task, and we consider it as a smell. If you have a long statement, it's difficult to read, difficult to understand, and if you have more than a certain number of number of operators in a same expression, then we also consider it a smell. Well, you use case statement, but you forget to uh, write default. Then it's wow. That's okay. It's the admission that, OK, I'm doing that. <laughs> Duplicate entity, you have a same attribute specified multiple time. Missing conditional, when you have an else if, but you don't have leading else. So if you don't have leading else, which means that probably you should make this else if as a else. There are certain conventions when it comes to usage of quotes, in, especially in Puppet. So when to use single quote and when to use double quotes. And when you violate that, those, those uh, best practices, then you introduce improper quote usage smell. Same applies with the usage of variables. So you need to uh, guard the variable if you are using um, and quotes. So that's another smell. And alignment, although it may look very trivial, but alignment is also uh, makes it a little bit difficult to read if you have don't uh, if you don't don't align the lines uh, in your code. And invalid property value, so you supposed to specify uh, the property value using four-digit octal number rather than three-digit, as it was it is done here. And <clears throat> misplaced attribute. So the required attribute uh, must come first, and optional attribute, attributes should come later. So if that gets violated, then you introduce that smell. Similarly, let's take some more examples for uh, design configuration smells. And uh, as I said, that design configuration smell deals with module design and the structure of the project or the repository. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show some code, something like this. And I'll ask you, you please feel free to say what you think about this uh, piece of code. So OK, there is a file and a puppet file. Uh, and then you see something like this. You have class, declaration, again, class, class, class. Or take a look. This is another snippet. 
you have a class and you have certain resources described. So you have some uh, one package service service package file user. What you see? What 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 could be a problem here? <coughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, they. I mean, these these two things are related with Apache. But okay, this is MySQL as we can see. This is PHP and many other things. So they don't go with each other. They are not cohesive with each other. And when we say uh, when and and, and people who are uh, uh, who code in uh, traditional software engineering uh, languages. We know that that's, a, that's called single responsibility principle. If we write a method or a class, that's supposed to follow single responsibility principle. And when that gets violated, we introduce multifaceted abstraction. And by the way, this character is from uh, uh, Indian epic called, uh, called Ramayana. And this, the name of the character is Ravan, who has 10 heads, and uh, which, is, which I have put it to show that it's a multifaceted. It's doing too many things. OK, so let's, uh, let's, let's take a uh, next example. What's the problem? There is nothing, right? Why somebody has written a class and put no uh, nothing in that? You might find it a very, uh, you know, trivial or very weird that why somebody will create a class and not write anything inside that. And I was also like, I was also shocked when I said, mm, "This could, I mean, who will do that?" But we actually analyzed more than 4,600 Puppet repositories from GitHub, and we found more than 4,300 such instances. So almost one instance per repository on an average. On an average. So it's, there are many people who is doing this. And I mean, as you can guess, it's uh, unnecessary. Uh, whenever we uh, specify class or define, we supposed to you write something in this. Obviously, it's very trivial to, uh, to observe this, that write something. Otherwise, maybe remove this. There is no purpose for that. This is interesting. What you observe here? Yes? Yes. But is there any problem? So what? Adjects are allowed in Puppet. Excellent. That's not declarative. Puppet, by definition, by uh, natively, it's a declarative language. What it means is that you're supposed to specify what you want. What you want. It's not. It's not. Uh, you're not supposed to say that exactly what you want to achieve, how you want to achieve. That that's not your job. You just need to specify to Puppet that what precisely you want to achieve. And obviously, you can write some exact statements. Uh, it's sometime it's required actually to write exact statements, but if your whole repository is containing only exact statements, then probably you are violating the semantics of the puppet. And that's what uh, we call imperative abstraction smell, when it is statements on the, on the code is more imperative rather than declarative. What do you think about this? Yeah, no class. We have resources defined, but they are loosely defined in a and hanging in the in in, a, in the module. Why not? When when the language supports abstraction, I mean, in, in form of class and define, why not use them and use and encapsulate them in a unit so that if required, we can use them or refer them wherever it's uh, uh, wherever you need it. So that's called. Missing abstraction smell, configuration smell. This must be very simple. Anybody? Yeah, they are same. They are cloned. They are duplicate. 
So it happens in, uh, even in configuration code. We have seen in uh, normal production code, but it also happens in configuration code. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's when, when you have a certain piece of uh, a num number of statements duplicated across the repository, then it's possibly you are missing an abstraction. Maybe you need to accept that those duplicated statements, create an abstraction, and use reuse whenever you want. I know you can't read it, but that's, you are, you're not supposed to read it because this is what happens. You open a file and you say, OK, first resource, second resource, third resource, and then you go, go on and go on. And you see the, uh, the, the scroll bar, and it's very tiny in your text editor. And that's and you actually, after, after following uh, a few resources, you forget what was in, uh, in the top. And that's because, in general, uh, we say in human cognition that a normal human mind can remember only seven plus minus two things at a time. So if you increase, I mean, if, if, if you have, say, 100 resources defined in a single file, then it's, it's impossible for anybody to remember what was there and where was there. And if you need to change something, then where to change? And that we call insufficient modularization. And that happens when you have, uh, when the abstraction is large or complex. And thus, you can actually decompose the abstraction and make it smaller. <coughs> This is re related to the structure of the repository. So when you have one module uh, design and, or, or uh, the, the repository de design in a, some one way and the another module in another way, the structure is different in the same repository or in, in your project, that if there are multiple repositories, one repository is following one kind of a structure and another repository is containing uh, another uh, following another structure then it's very difficult and if you don't many times people don't have defined structure they just keep putting uh, the module definitions or uh, or the file relevant file and just dumping in a single folder if you have something like that it's a uh, it's it's basically an unstructured module so you need to have one single consistent uh, structure for the repository, and then you follow it across all your projects. So for example, if you have modules, and then you have a separate folder for each module, and you have a certain structure, something like this, then, and, then, and you follow the similar structure in the rest of the modules, then it's OK. But if you don't follow that, then you are introdu introducing this method. What is this? And whoever tells me, uh, this is a dependency graph, and whoever tells me that which software uh, I'm talking about, I will give you a book. First one. No. No. Who said JUnit? OK. This is the dependency structure of JUnit. And uh, you can see this, that you can't make sense of, I mean, at least immediately, you can't make sense of what's happening and who's depending on what. You need, any a normal person need, require some time to understand what's happening here. And probably in our projects also, if you go and generate something like this, some, some diagram, something like this, then you will find something close to that. I'm sure about that. And when something like this, very dense, happen, we say it's a dense structure smell. And uh, I mean, it, it's, it's basically the, the, the repository has excessive and dense dependencies to different modules. It's, there are two scenarios here. In the left-hand side, we have some uh, resources referring to each other, and there are many uh, references to other modules. In the right-hand side, there are more references uh, inside a module and lesser outside the module. And in uh, traditional software engineering, we call it these concepts as cohesion and coupling. So when a unit has 
resources which is tightly uh, related to each other, we say it's showing high cohesion. And when the same module is showing, uh, it's depending on a lot of other modules, then we say it's, it's showing high uh, coupling. And this is what we captured in this smell. We say it's a weakened modularity when uh, it is a computed like, it's a ratio between cohesion and coupling. And it happens when, when, when a module is exhibiting high coupling and low cohesion. OK, so at this point, let's take a step back and think about it. Why smells are important? I mean, you may think that uh, some of the smells, at least some of the smells that we seen, they are very trivial. Think, uh, for example, alignment. The, it's very trivial, and you probably ignore it. But think about it, why it is important to consider the impact of a smell. <coughs> Have you heard of a story of a camel whose uh, back was broken by the straw? Yes? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so the straw, if you look at the individual straw, it's very light. You can't imagine, anybody can't imagine that a straw can break a uh, break the back of the camel. But obviously there are many, many things and the straws are many, there are many straws that are there that make it possible to put a one more straw and the camel's back is broken. The same analogy applies to smells. If you look at individual smells, they are very trivial many a times you think, OK, this is not really what I should be caring about. But the cumulative effect of the, uh, all the smells in your system might be something like this. So that's, uh, that's why uh, considering smells, detecting them, and, and avoiding them, it's, in my opinion, it's very important. OK, so we have learned about a few uh, smells that may occur in configuration code, uh, how we can detect them. There are at least two tools. First one is Puppet Lint. It's not our tool, uh, but we have used it. Uh, and uh, you can detect many implementation configuration smells using this tool. The second tool is Puppeteer which uh, I wrote uh, majorly with my, one of my um, more colleague in uh, university. And uh, it's an open source tool you can download from here. You can clone it. You can fork it whatever way you want to use it. Please feel free. And uh, this is the tool that, uh, that can detect all the smells that I described. You can detect all of those uh, smells in Puppet code. So feel free to use them. We also carried out a study, uh, since we are a by default researchers, so we carried out a research on Puppet code and the quality of Puppet code. And we uh, analyzed more than 4,600 repositories, uh, more approximately 9 million lines of Puppet code. And we found many interesting patterns there. So if you are interested in that study, this is the link. Uh, you can uh, download the paper and you can uh, go into the details. Or you can write to me or you can call me and we can have a discussion. So let's summarize what we, what should I put it here? Please be louder. A. A, yes. Here. S and L here. Puppeteer, yes. And what you get is maintainability. Okay, that's it, folks. 
Um, if you want me, if you want to troll me, this is my Twitter account. If you want me, if you want to troll me privately, this is my email address. If you want to physically troll me, you can come here and you can talk to me.